Brick is our own product. You've got to start in life, uh, perhaps in this building or in the next building, uh, before you've got a bachelor's degree in ceramic engineering here at Rutgers. Uh, you then get this little wave, waiver hat uh, to that small engineering institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where as a Draper Lab fellow, uh, he got a PhD from MIT in 1987. He then uh, returned to Rutgers, where he's had a very distinguished career ever since. Uh, during that time, he's uh, uh, spent some time as a visiting professor in the Technical University in, in Mark, uh, and also as an NSF intern at Pentakine America, incorporated in Monmouth Junction, New Jersey. Uh, Rick has received uh, lots of recognitions of his research and scholarly activity through the years. Uh, that includes the very competitive and prestigious Young Investigator Award from the uh, Office of Naval Research. Uh, also the Alcoa Foundation uh, Science Fellow. Um, and one that maybe you could tell us a little bit about today, the Rodner Nace Musical Scholarship. <laughs> proving that like all engineers, he's a very well-rounded uh, individual. He did lots of uh, he's been very prolific in his time here at Rutgers, engaged in ceramic related research. Uh, more than 160 archival pu publications, 11 patents, and more than 400 presentations. Rutgers re re recognized him for his contributions last year uh, as the 2009 Rutgers University Board of Trustees Excellence in Research Award. That makes him very eminently qualified to come and tell us about his research. So with that, I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Well, thanks for that nice introduction. I was wondering who you were talking about. Um, in any case, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to give this talk today, kind of tell you what I've been thinking about for the last uh, uh, year or two. Um, and before I do that, I really need to recognize uh, all the people that have really helped uh, me uh, prepare uh, for this point in, in, in my research. And uh, so I'm going to be featuring um, uh, the work of uh, Vahid Adikhan, uh, Alexander Bruchkin, left his aunt Yen off here, Brian Jackson, Margaret Lenska, uh, uh, Ching Wa Li, who assisted me a lot in the, in the preparation of this talk. Uh, uh, Shailen Liu, who, uh, whose work I'll feature along with that of Elizabeth and Larry McCandlish, uh, Kate McCulka, um, Christina Massad, and uh, um, Magda Lenska, Pascal Pinsloop, and uh, some collaborative work with Jerry Shen, as well as uh, uh, Eugene Zolotnikov. All people have spent uh, nice, t nice amounts of time to work with me here at Rutgers. And, uh, the work here was uh, made possible through support through the Office of Naval Research, Center for Ceramic Research, and Asia Corporation, at least Asia Tech Corporation, for, for today's uh, research. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some rather obvious things uh, for people who are in the material science department. Uh, that is, you know, what are ceramics? Um, also, I'm going to go through what do we actually mean by uh, green, um, and then a little bit of background in the ceramics as well as ceramics contribution um, to not only greenhouse gases but also what it has to do with uh, energy um, but more from the manufacturing standpoint it's in Im its impact on that um, and then some of the incremental innovations that might help make uh, ceramics a much more green manufacturing approach as well as uh, some suggestions for some disruptive innovations and, and then a brief sampling of what I've got going on here at Rutgers that's moving in that direction. So what is this thing called green manufacturing? Uh, well, it's related to this whole buzzword these days called sustainability. Okay, so we have this multi-step process for making... If you just start with the raw materials, um, even the raw materials themselves are very frequently not green. Okay, when you start with minerals, aside from the environmental damage of mining, uh, 
to worry about all the energy required to uh, mill materials. And roughly about a half a percent of our full energy consumption in the nation is uh, spent grinding things. Um, so this is a big energy factor because of the huge amount of material that we, we dig out of the ground. Many of these minerals are carbonates, by the way, and that's going to be important because when we talk about industrial chemicals, a lot of times we do reactions at high temperature with solids, um, gases, heterogeneous phase cells, so liquids. Um, there are some processes where, other than precipitating these things, we may use electrochemistry, for example, potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. A lot of people think that's a green chemical. It's far from green. It takes a lot of electricity to make KOH um, before it, it gets to us. And it's a very energy inefficient process to do that. Uh, if we're making um, different kinds of single component um, materials, uh, a lot of times we'll want to calcine them before they're ready to be used as ceramics. So most frequently they're in carbonate form and they release CO2. And that's a big deal. You're going to see that. Almost the same amount of CO2 that's released in the calcination stage it equals approximately what it takes to fire the material. So uh, you literally, when you work with a carbonate, double your CO2 at, that actually comes out. So we go look at something like barium titanate, very frequently made from a material that's either either from carbonate or oxalate origin. Um, there's roughly uh, half of its all of its weight loss is pretty much uh, CO2 emissions. And then, like I said, you burn almost as much petroleum uh, or some kind of hydrocarbon to actually make this final product. And we're only in the powder stage at that point. Then we've got to grind this stuff just like we had with the original minerals. And then after we're done grinding it, we do another, we do a high temperature reaction as I mentioned. Um, in this case, uh, you may actually go through in many cases two different high temperature reactions before you're done, which would actually add another 30% more CO2 to the air. Um, so <clears throat> some people get around that by spraying things into high temperature furnaces, but then you're spending a lot of energy evaporating water in addition to all the other stuff I already told you about. So if we think about um, energy and we think about sources of CO2, um, we have decomposition of organics and carbonates. We need energy to power the mills and furnaces and the magnitudes of these things are, are significant. Um, now, if you're actually looking at the firing step, now that we have the raw materials, we haven't even made the monolithic ceramic body yet. We don't have the dinner plate yet. We can choose to cast it, which means we're going to mix it with water and spray it. Um, sometimes this spraying stuff isn't such low temperature. Here's a, ca a gunning mix that's actually sprayed at a, a very high temperature, around the temperature that steel is made. Um, these ramming mixes uh, are actually ones that don't require high temperatures, and they're, but they're usually used for high temperature furnaces to fire other things, and they rely on the hardening at that high temperature to give it its high strength. Glasses and single crystals are made by melt-based processes, um, quite elaborate, quite energy consuming. Um, if you're not going to melt, then you're going to go right, some fraction of the melting temperature and either work with glass or polycrystalline materials. And, um, either way, you're just spending a lot of energy doing all this stuff. Um, so here's the surprise. Um, it's drying and firing that uh, contribute a lot of the energy consumption. Roughly 30% of the cost of a ceramic is put into the energy for drying and firing. 30% of that uh, energy that I'm mentioning here is spent drying, and only, it only takes double that uh, for firing. And that, the reason why even though drying is a low temperature process, um, it's because uh, that the length of time required in drying is so much longer than a firing step that your energy consumption can, can in fact be comparable. And these are some of the numbers that, uh, of energy that you might consume per hour, and they're on the order of gigajoules. And when you're doing this process, maybe if you're lucky, 20% of the energy is actually going for the process you're trying to heat. So, there's a lot of problems with this, and as you can see, when you build a furnace like this and you have all these bricks, you've got to heat all that stuff up before you're ready to actually um, get some work done making the ceramics actually densify. So I prayed a pretty uh, grim picture of uh, what ceramics are in terms of energy, but here's, here's the part you probably didn't expect. If you look at energy intensity for different materials, um, aluminum is by far the worst. 
And maybe that might surprise you because uh, you think, well, gosh, you know, all you have to do is extrude the aluminum. But when you make the aluminum raw material, you expend a lot of energy uh, in an electrochemical process to actually make the aluminum raw material that's used uh, and ultimately cast. And plastics is not too far behind that. So even if you look at them from a recycled standpoint, there's a huge energy intensity factor. And then ceramics fall, but look at the difference. It's almost a factor, of, uh, well, it is a factor of, of five. And uh, steel is a little bit below it, which to me is a little, little surprising, but right behind it, it's cement, glass, and concrete. And so the only reason concrete is way down there is because it's really about 12% cement, and uh, then you have 82% rocks that you dig out of the ground and grind into lots of little pieces. Um, so let's pick on cement as, a, as, a, as something to look at. Uh, what's its contribution? Um, well, um, in terms of all the CO2 that's generated based on natural gas and fossil fuel, uh, the world in 2001 released about uh, 24 gigatons per year. So that, that's a pretty large number. And the U.S. is responsible for about six of that. So we're, we're up there as far as take accounting for 25% of that. China is like really moving fast. Uh, they are way, way higher than us. Um, I don't remember the exact number right now, but just in cement alone, they account for half of cement's production. And so that's about, uh, cement's production this year was 2.8 gigatons. China's responsible for half of that. So they already have about, uh, just in the cement industry alone, uh, half of 2.8, 1.4. Um, so what's cement like relative to other CO2 emitters? Um, well, coal-fired plants, pretty large number, eight gigatons, okay, in the United States. Uh, cement plants are about 0.9, okay? So about a factor of 10 between the power plant and a, coal, and, and a cement plant. So cement doesn't account for a huge amount of the CO2, but it's still significant. Look at um, steel mills. Steel mills are, are lower than cement, but the thing you got to keep in mind is look at the number of sources. It's, it's almost an order of magnitude different. And actually, a steel plant emits as much as a power plant. So if you really go gangbusters and building lots of steel mills in this uh, country, we're going to uh, really have a serious uh, CO2 problem. <laughs> OK. so. Uh, What's interesting is if you look at the metrics on CO2, more CO2 is released than materials in a single year. So here's cement here in terms of the CO2 number for 2006. Um, and um, here's um, iron ore, bauxite. Now these, these coins, let me clarify, these are the amount of material that are actually being made, not CO2. So if you look at 24 gigatons and you take all the bauxite, all the iron ore, all the soda ash, including this stuff, uh, uh, you may use for making baking soda and all that, on silicon, it doesn't come close to adding up to this number. So that's, and, and if, it, just think of it in terms of the U.S. alone, okay? Um, if we think of, this is, these are world numbers. The U.S.'s portion was six gigatons. It's still larger than all this added together. Um, so cements, you know, really topped the list, at least in the ceramics group. Uh, it accounts for about 5% of CO2 in the world. In the U.S., the number drops to 1%. It's only because uh, the efficiency of the furnaces is greater, so you're getting more energy uh, out of your hydrocarbons than in other parts of the world. And ceramics and glasses play second, but that's kind of a guess. I just can't get any numbers on that right now. So if anyone's seen an article that really talks about specific metrics, uh, I'm interested in, in doing that, uh, but we'll definitely be looking at calculating it ourselves if, if we're not able to find it. Um, so this is the cement process. I'm not going to walk you through the whole process. I'm just going to show you the nightmare portions of it. Here's a rotary kiln, okay? These rotary kilns can be literally as long as a quarter mile, okay? They are really big furnaces. They're in a diameter. It could be something as large as 18 feet in diameter. And you're taking, in a wet process, something that you're drying, and by the time you get to the end of the process, you have these big chunky stones bouncing out there called clinker. And those things actually need to be ground up. So here's the mill here. You also need a mill at the beginning of the process as well to conditioning all the raw materials. So all the grinding here and all the grinding here, as well as the high temperature heating, 
uh, make cement really, really ungreen. And here's uh, some numbers just to tell you. And, and <clears throat> the thing to pay attention to is that I'm talking about concrete here. Okay, so I'm adding in all the energy required for digging up all the stone that you're going to mix with the cement and then all the energy required to make the cement itself. And uh, what you find is if you look at all that, including, you know, hey, get the truck and drive it to the location, okay? We haven't left anything out here, the energy for the mining as well. Um, I told you, already told you, the energy required uh, for grinding is, is huge, but it's not compared to the energy to heat the kiln as well as the kiln reaction. So let me tell you a little more about this kiln reaction. It also takes a, a significant portion uh, of uh, energy as well. So this is CO2. So you can see the kiln um, carbonate decomposition reaction that I mentioned earlier before. And um, the CO2 from the fuel are, are really comparable numbers. And the fuel, uh, just for that firing step, just overwhelms any other step, whether it's the transportation or the mining or anything. So here's the breakdown approximately. Everybody has their own way of tallying it. Uh, Henrik Van Oss, I think, has one of the nicest papers that looks at that. So for the CO2 uh, release from carbonate decomposition, it's about a half a ton of CO2 per ton of cement, okay? And for the fuel, it's about uh, 0.43, but don't forget to add the electricity for running the mills and everything. So it's roughly 50-50 if you want to divide these into two. And then the energy is somewhere between three to six gigajoules per ton of cement. That's, you know, that's a fair amount of, of energy. And um, you can remember some of the numbers I mentioned earlier. It's not terribly, terribly far from that. Um, but it varies on the efficiency. And basically, it's how old your cement plant is. The older it is, the less efficient it is. Um, now, um, you'll expect to see this for any other ceramic manufacturing process, if not worse. It's just that nothing equals the quantity of cement. When you're talking about megatons for some of the larger ceramic markets, and you're talking about gigatons for, some of, uh, for cement, it's, it's a you know, factor of 1,000 different. Um, so, but the other point I want to make uh, is that if we wipe out cement and the ceramics industries, it's not going to solve the global warming problem. But the biggest problem is that um, all the regulations and things like that that come up, which I'll talk about a little later, is going to sweep the ceramics industry in, and it might end up sweeping the business out of this country unless something's done. So uh, the percentage is, is, is an important wedge. It's not a big wedge. It's going to be a tiny little slither, but still worth, worth doing because all I know is that if I want to continue to work here, I'd at least like to have a few companies that I can send my students out to work for. Um, it's not going to happen if uh, uh, all these other things happen. So what are we going to do? Let's just talk about CO2. I mean, it's kind of obvious, you know, with energy. We saw gas rise to like $4 a gallon and more. You can imagine what that does to a business. It only gets somewhere between 3 and 27% of its energy to actually heat the solids up. Um, it, it, that, that's kind of an obvious thing. That's something that you normally think about. But what about this CO2 thing? The two terms you're going to hear about is cap and trade and the carbon tax. Nobody wants anything like that who's in business because in the cap and trade, someone's going to decide how much CO2 you're allowed to release. And if you can stay under that number, then the stuff that you haven't released, well, you can go trade it with somebody else and they can pay you some money for it. That's hopefully less than the penalties for going above your allowance. Um, the other way of doing it is rather than giving everybody an allowance, right, uh, we're talking about a carbon tax. So if you don't want to be taxed, don't release anything. So there's this whole game, which I could do a whole talk in itself called capture and sequestration, or what they call carbon capture and sequestration. The term you'll hear is called CCS. And um, sequestration is nothing more than storing the CO2 somewhere, as long as it doesn't go into the air, okay? Air meaning anything above the ground, okay? Because I'll show you what people are actually proposing to do and what the DOE has endorsed 100%. And some of it's pretty, uh, it's pretty surprising when you think of all the details that need to be worked out. Uh, but in any case, the, either of these things really give a strong incentive to develop uh, technologies that have what's called a low 
or a small carbon footprint. That is, how much CO2 do you plan on, on releasing? Okay, like for example, if you drive your car a mile, uh, you've just released something like um, three quarters of a pound of CO2. Okay, that's your contribution when you go uh, to the store. Your footprint is definitely not negative. Nobody's is here. So what does the carbon task done to the rest of the world? Because we are behind in a big way. Um, Sweden has been doing this for a long time, and uh, they've seen you know, a 20% emissions drop as a result of having a carbon tax. And this is what they're paying for this, OK? Now, this might sound like a lot, um, but I'll give you some numbers in a few minutes that will show you that, you know what? Um, this, this might actually, this might even be a deal when you consider the true costs of capturing and storing carbon. Um, Finland, um, you know, lower price, you know, uh, smaller uh, reduction, um, approximately same time frame. Um, Denmark, 15%. Norway is interesting because they're actually got an increase even though they got a $65 tax, but that's because they've become much more of a manufacturing entity than they ever were before. But they're, as you'll see, uh, they're getting really good habits. Um, and Canada is just the first uh, on our side of the block to come up with a tax, and we're still trying to decide what to do about all this. And here's some numbers on uh, emissions. Um, <clears throat> so if you're curious how many pounds of CO2, uh, if you know your gas mileage, you can calculate it for yourself. Um, and if you think about coal, since it's used quite often for power generation, Here's some numbers that you would end up paying at least if they end up having some kind of CO2 tax that, you know, the electric company is surely going to pass on to you. Actually, it's going to be much more than that because this is all what the government's charging. Um, one of the I'll show you some more bad news in a few minutes, but um, just do a quick calculation. If you have a $12 CO2 tax, uh, for cement alone, that means $37 billion at 2009 production. So. That's, that's a lot of uh, money to add. Or in other words, uh, roughly $3, $6 a ton. And you easily use a couple of tons if you're putting in a couple of side, uh, sidewalk pieces. So um, this is what people envision doing. They take the CO2, and it's very much what they do with soda pop, OK? They use an amine, and the amine catches the CO2 because the amine is basic and the CO2 is acidic. <laughs> And it forms what's called an addict. Basically, the two molecules just hug each other in the liquid. And they don't really want to go anywhere. They just sit in the water. And we throw it through a stripping tower that makes the amine separate from the CO2. And then the CO2 goes to a pressurization tank where they pressurize it to about 2,000 PSI. And what they do at that point is they send it out to a pipeline. This pipeline goes out a couple of miles off of Norway. Um, I've seen pictures of this, I, but I didn't want to inundate you with photos. But they take this uh, 2,000 PSI line and they inject it way underground. And they use it to force out methane gas so they can get more gas out uh, from underneath the ocean. But they're also storing it. And a lot of the rock that's here is able to react with, with the CO2 and uh, keep it uh, nice and stable. So this is way below the ocean's floor. And they have actually successfully done this. And uh, they actually store an enormous amount, about a megaton a year. And they're making this work. Uh, and they um, get about 100K a day in um, uh, carbon tax. So it's a, good, uh, it's a good deal. They're making it work. But let me just tell you a few things about this system. I don't even know what this costs. I don't know what the government spent for that, but I can tell you that if you run a power plant where you use this soda pop approach towards pulling the CO2 out and compressing it, it's going to raise your electric bill by 65%. That's the estimate right now. And if we're lucky, maybe only 33%. So if you think about the numbers that I showed you with the carbon tax, it's actually a much smaller price than what it actually costs to really store this stuff. And that's because it takes a huge amount of energy to strip this CO2 from the amine and to pressurize it. You've got to run machines. You've got to heat things. You've got to run uh, compressors. And that comes from the electric power plant. And that's, so that takes all the electricity out. So now that I've paid, painted this really droll picture, uh, there's no hope, right? We can't fire these things. So we've got way too much uh, energy 
uh, to pay for. We've got way too much CO2. Nobody has a good way of putting it underground. By the way, the DOE thinks we should bury everything underground. And the lawyers have really sharpened their teeth on this because they want to use, for example, old mines. And that sounds like a good idea, except you never know exactly where all the holes are. And there are instances where pressurized uh, gases um, have actually gone out of some of these mysterious openings and created uh, gushers in lakes and other places. Uh, so it's not, it's not that easy. And there, there's, there's discussion, by the way. You know, there's a cogeneration plant in Linden. There's conversations about having a 2,000 PSI line going out uh, to the Atlantic Highlands. And there's a beautiful basalt formation way under the ocean where for just a price, I think, I think it's somewhere, project cost of about $4 billion, we can get that line out there and, and start injecting. I'll bet you anything, if it's anything like the big dig up in Boston, uh, count on it being $50 billion. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do about ceramics? Because, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, uh, maybe you're going to get rid of our department, <laughs> all this talk about uh, industry going out of this country. But uh, if we use minerals and waste products where we can, uh, that's going to be a big helper because we've already expended the energy to, to, to use these things. And there's lots of minerals that don't require very much in the way of grinding. Um, and also just minimizing the need to grind. You know, don't grind any more than you really have to to get your process to work. And then there's the whole game of reducing processing temperature and improving process reliability. A lot of ceramics manufacturing may be 50% yield on the product, so you threw all that energy in the garbage. Uh, instead of utilizing it somehow, as well as the CO2. Um, get rid of carbonate reactants, because they just release it way too much CO2. The, only f the reality is, though, if there is any well, traditional ceramics people out in the audience, they know they can't live without this stuff, because it costs, everything else costs too much, because carbonates are so damn thermodynamically stable, they're just all over the place. Um, Find a way to eliminate the need for water. It's kind of funny how we work with ceramics. We add water, then we evaporate it, then we add it again, then we evaporate it. And water is very energy intensive. But find ways to minimize the number of steps where you have to do something like that. And don't use organic additives because they're going to release CO2. And the other thing is a lot of times we're mixing things really poorly. If we mixed them better, we wouldn't need as high a temperature. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily need milling as well. So um, what can we do on the forming side of it? Well, we can learn how to pack particles better. Here's a, a, a packed array of silica that we've made in our lab. I'll tell you more later about how we do that. Um, but you can reduce a lot of energy in the forming process and the firing process if you can get packing like this, because you never see anything like that. The question is, how do you do that and still minimize um, you know, the CO2 output? Because a lot of these fancy chemicals that you might use for making these compounds are really far from green. They're much uglier than the stuff that I've already told you about. Um, and uh, also develop net shape forming processes so we don't have to grind our materials to their final shape. Um, so those are some of the things. From the thermal side, um, you know, why heat all this brick in a furnace? Try to reduce the mass of brick. Use alternative fuels. Directed energy is a way of not heating brick, maybe concentrating the solar rays or using microwaves which couple directly with the material you're firing and not what the furnace is housed with. Reduce the firing temperature um, by improving the mixing. Again, just stop, stop using water. Um, maybe you can do drying, fabrication, firing in one step in a way where you can save energy. Um, more stuff. Um, just lots of things we'll associate with equipment. Um, uh, again, uh, this, this is kind of the summary. Lower the, lower the temperature at the times. Uh, these are all things I, I mentioned already. Get the rejection rate down. Um, but here's some disruptive things. So this is, this is where there's lots of really neat stuff to do. Avoid CO2 generation, or minimize it at least, um, by some of the things I already mentioned, but there's other things we can do which I'll show you. And try consuming CO2. Try taking some out of the air instead. Um, and try making some drastic changes in processing temperature. And try to make things that actually perform better than the stuff that's made the conventional way. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, painting in your house. You know if you use the oil-based paint, it always comes better, out better than the, than the water-based, but you know it's bad for you. You know it's bad for the environment. But people still all know it comes out better. But if you can make materials that, in fact, are actually better, 
then people won't see being green as having a cost associated with it. So that's where the research opportunities are. So here's something, you know, uh, maybe instead of, uh, you know, uh, working with big pieces of marble, mix the calcium carbonate with a polymer to make engineered marble. Um, these, these kind of processes head towards carbon neutrality, but they're really not uh, making any kind of a huge impact. Uh, moving along, I mean, there's better practicing examples like in glass manufacture where people take waste glass product and, and throw it into a glass batch to improve the glass manufacture. And the energy savings um, in terms of money uh, for in energy and disposal is, is very significant. And it also makes the, reduces pollutants as well. Um, electrical power consumption, um, <clears throat> if you just make the motors and drives Systems that you use more efficient, you can save a lot on electricity. They're using photovoltaics. Here's the kinds of metrics on tons of CO2 that's saved, fuel cells, uh, cogeneration, in other words, locate your plant where you want to generate electrical power. And then this other area, which really is a big potential in the US, is recovering the heat that you throw into the air. Instead of seeing these smokestacks with lots of stuff coming out, uh, attach a pipe onto it and try to collect that energy. And if you can do that, you can provide, in savings, 19% of the nation's electricity. So that's a, that's a big number. And the technology is here, and it's far from being implemented. Um, so let's go into materials technologies. Drywall. Um, there's drywall that is currently made in a way where you have to uh, heat the plaster of Paris to remove some of the water crystallization, um, as well as drying material. Um, it has a huge energy impact. If you can avoid that step, which a company called Serious Materials has achieved, you can get 80% less energy required and 80% less CO2. It's still CO2 positive, meaning it produces more CO2, but you know, it, it's an improvement. It's making it easier um, uh, because you're using less energy that lowers the cost as well as the CO2 footprint. Well, there's a company called Skyonics, meaning you know, using the sky as a mine. And uh, here, they're making electric chemical sodium hydroxide. So this sounds like a pretty cool thing. You make sodium bicarbonate. Here's the thing. Worldwide production of sodium bicarbonate is 42 megatons. So all you need is six power plants, and you produce the world's sodium bicarbonate. They're done. You can't do any more than six plants, unless you can find some new uses uh, for the stuff. Also, what are we going to do with all the chlorine and hydrogen gas? Well, I know what I do with the hydrogen gas, but the chlorine is roughly dependent on how much plastic you sell. And that's where most of it goes. And, and also, there's a huge parasitic energy loss by making the sodium hydroxide. And so this is a real nut and shell game. Everybody comes up with some new way of doing something, but they don't factor in what the impact of this is. And that sodium hydroxide is huge in terms of the amount of CO2. Is. And I don't actually know what the number is exactly is, but the cheapest you can make this stuff is somewhere on the order of about 15 cents a pound, which means that you know, a ton is about $300. If you're going to make any kind of useful material in the cement industry, you better, better be fractions of $100 a ton, not 300 And uh, that's just the beginning. Uh, Alcoa, in the process of making aluminum, generates lots of CO2 by consumption of their carbon electrodes and all the electricity that's used. Um, so they have this material called red mud, which is a product of the process. It's basically mostly iron oxide and some sodium hydroxide. And so people are using that as an additive to cementitious materials. And because it's highly basic, it also pulls CO2 in. So there's a lot of effort in Australia. Right now, they're taking in about 70,000 tons per year, and they're going to be bringing it up to about 300. So this is significant, and this is used as a filler for road beds, building materials, and, and even just conditioning soil. Perfectly safe because the CO2 is neutralizing the sodium hydroxide. Um, and then there's another area um, of cement where people are calling, calling this technology accelerated carbonation, where you're basically putting CO2 in a gas, and while the cement is curing, you're actually adding the CO2. And this is just a cartoon of the cycle for doing that. But there's no way you're ever, even if you take all the calcium in, remember, even if you put all the CO2 back in the cement, you still have all that fuel you've spent. 
you know, trying to uh, heat that cement and make it a cement. So you're only going to account for cut the amount of CO2 at most by a factor of uh, two, but not get rid of it. Um, people like to take, uh, make magnesium-based cements. Um, this is a company in Australia that's trying to commercialize this. At best, this is carbon neutral because they, what they want to do is take a magnesium carbonate, calcine it using the solar sun rays, then react it with water afterwards to get all the CO2 back. So if you don't count the energy of the sun, um, at best you have what's called a carbon neutral material. So that's the best that you can do there. Um, and, and then there's this company called Calera, which has an interesting idea. Um, what they want to do is say, hey, let's just make an additive to concrete that replaces all the stone that we're putting in. And because it's made of CO2, uh, because we use 88% uh, aggregate and 12% cement, if we replace a lot of that aggregate with our new calcium carbonate, then we're going to be able to store a lot of CO2 underground. Because after all, uh, there's over 100 um, gigatons of concrete that are actually being made, so there's plenty of room for that. And so that gives them the excuse to make, um, once again, sodium hydroxide, which their selling point is, hey, we figured out how to make it 60% more energy efficient, but it's still sucking energy out of the power plant, and that's one of the problems. The other thing they're doing that's nice, though, is they're using brine um, from reverse osmosis for the source of cations. And then ultimately, they're making this carbonate salt, which is the additive for, for concrete. So this is, this is another way to kind of get around being green by finding some way of replacing something that can make the whole process appear carbon negative. Because you're avoiding, you're storing the carbon in the process of doing this. But I still don't think their calculation is, they've placed no numbers on what the CO2 footprint is for making the alkaline earth hydroxide. They have to do this. You cannot take cations out of seawater unless you raise the pH to at least 13 or 14. And then the process of precipitating the solids lowers the pH back to 7. It's a neutralization reaction. So for you know, every mole of material they want out as a carbonate, they're going to have to have one CO2 neutralized by a sodium hydroxide. So we'd like to see what that number is. Okay. So that aside, what are we actually doing? Um, well, we're working on uh, techniques that use low temperature processes for making ceramic powders. And, you know, we can boast typically tenfold reductions in processing temperatures. And by controlling the size and morphology, we avoid the need for the milling, so we no longer have to grind things. We use water-based routes so that we can recover the water. In fact, we precipitate these things from aqueous solutions, which leaves you with clean water afterwards. Um, doing some also some interesting work where we're not working with water, but uh, very, we, we make these energy, these materials that require quite a bit of energy in the uh, extraction and everything called rare earth-based materials. And I have a collaboration with uh, John Brennan, the chemistry department who makes these beautiful colloidal molecules that have rare earths in them, and he can make them at room temperature. Um, uh, also, just work, we have work going on with composites where we're taking advantage of self-assembly and improving mixing. So let me just mention a few of these things. Um, here's some uh, neat work that uh, uh, Vahit uh, Adekan uh, did for his PhD, where we looked at this whole process of making barium titanate, BATIO3, from this barium titan oxalate. So an oxalate is actually two CO molecules joined at the hip, so to speak. And um, these metal oxalates are calcined. So for every mole of barium titanate, you get two mo uh, moles of CO2. You usually have to heat this above 900 degrees C. Um, the reaction time is at least three hours. You have to mill it. It's not very green. So one of the things that Vahid says, well, said to himself is, well, gee, you know, what if I uh, look at a way of doing it in water? So the way we start is calculating a phase diagram using thermodynamic principles. And so this shaded area here shows you where um, you need to run your reaction conditions in order to run this reaction, where we take an oxalate and um, we uh, react it to form barium titan. And this is actually an equivalent reaction. This is actually a single compound, but this is the only way we could model it. So this model told us if we add lots of KOH to the system, not only will we get barium titanate, but we won't release any CO2. And this is a room temperature diagram. So we were dying to find out if this thing actually worked. And lo and behold, in a few minutes, you can make barium titanate. 
straight from the same raw material that industry says can only be done at high temperature and milled. And here's some examples of the powders. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're, this is a very good first result that shows we can make the particles small and spherical. And from here, we can optimize a lot of the, a lot of the process. And this is a video that, uh, uh, that Vahid had taken, uh, which I don't think uh, the safety people are really uh, that jazzed about. But you'll get an idea of how Thermo describes energy. So, so what he's doing is, um, uh, first, he's adding the barium titanyl oxalate uh, to water. And then in the second step, he's going to add the KOH to the system. And you'll see what happens once the extraction starts with KOH. So I think it's kind of self-explanatory. So he's just stirring this thing. It's, it's mildly heated. And here it goes. Stand back. Okay, so if I had the sound on, you'd hear these guys uh, um, acting a little scared of what just happened. But, but he just made barium titanate, okay? Right in front of your eyes. So we like to call this instant hydrothermal synthesis, or IHS. Um, and, um, whoops, let's see, how do I go to the next slide here? Okay, well, here's another example of making biomaterials. Again, here's a road map for the reaction conditions we need to work at. And this work was kind of interesting, some work done by Christina Massad for her PhD. And what she was looking at was, well, gee, how do we make hydroxyapatite at room temperature, but use compounds that the body actually wouldn't find poisonous at all, and do it at room temperature, so you could imagine making this material even in a surgery room. And uh, here's, uh, again, she did the modeling, and the experiment showed that she could make a material that is some of the smallest particle size hydroxyapatite in the world. It's about two or three nanometers. The material is so unstable that if you let it sit for five months, it does something that ceramists think are unthinkable. You go from a crystalline material to being an amorphous material because there's so much surface there. Uh, there's more atoms on the surface than there is in the bulk, so the whole thing just goes disordered, and the crystallite uh, size actually increases by a factor of uh, 10. Um, and so here's another one, just as a last example. We have a bunch of particles. Maybe we made them at low temperature. Instead of using high pressure, high energy equipment to assemble things, let's use self-assembly. So what we do is we take the particles. They're suspended in a liquid. We drop them onto a water bath, and we functionalize the surface so that the particles don't float on water. So here we're floating something that's 8 grams per cc on something that's one gram per cc. We make it so non-wetting it can support its weight. So this is a material called lead zirconate titanate. And the alcohol inside this um, dropper, when it hits the water, spreads. And when it spreads, it delivers the particles to this raft. So think about this as like the bubbles, you know, when you're taking a bubble bath, how they like to assemble on the other side of the bathtub and form beautiful hexagonal arrays. Now we have these particles packing themselves into dense arrays, and if we put a glass slide into there, we can actually pull this material right off of the water um, to make a beautiful monolayer film. And so here's an example where we use industrial aluminum oxide and show we can pack these materials beautifully as a single layer of particles. Um, so imagine this material as an epoxy coating on a floor. It would be very hard. It's the densest packing of particles uh, uh, in, in an epoxy. One of the, uh, that you can achieve, and I'm, I'm not showing you the composite, but we are able to do that. Um, here's another example where we're using cubes, where we're packing the cubes, and here's an inset showing a natural material, which is just uh, what the microstructure or pearl looks like. So we're beginning to mimic nature, you know, with these self-assembly processes. And uh, here's uh, another structure we made is a single self-standing layer having polymer. So here's a cobblestone road, and here's the material that we made that's about a micron thick. Um, again, all being done at room temperature, uh, using basically nothing more than rubbing alcohol, water, and a Dixie cup, and a glass slide. Um, and there's that silica example I showed you before, and this was just kind of a neat picture on throwing that. We can actually watch the particles assemble using a technique called particle image velocimetry and uh, working with uh, Jerry Shan's group to learn how to do that, because these guys know all about how to image uh, fluids. And there's some really interesting fluid motion that happens here, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So in summary, I'd, I'd like to close and, and just say that um, ceramic manufacturing can contribute a significant wedge 
towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well as reducing energy. Um, <clears throat> but it's more the survival. The cost of the energy use and the CO2 emissions is what we really need to be concerned about because the industry at you know, $3 or $6 or $10, or if they actually tally up what it really costs to take CO2 out of the air, who knows, even $150, uh, could make it impossible to build a business in, in this country. So that's, we really got to figure out what to do about this. And impacting the short-term short and long-term measures, um, I've, I've proposed some of these, shown you some of the things that people are actually doing. Um, and then, you know, some issue, uh, hopefully I've made it interesting t to you, it's at least really interesting to me that, you know, we've got a lot of really interesting ideas that we're pursuing now to try to make a difference. And hopefully a year from now, uh, you'll, you'll hear about what that is. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Maybe you said it. Uh, we'll keep the CO2 versus wood, glass, and steel for building or pricing and uh, building. Well, in terms of. <laughs> oh, okay. If you look at the energy intensity of concrete, it's the lowest on the list. And aluminum is the very top. So there's about, in terms of energy intensity factor, there's a factor of 185. Um, it, repeat what you said again. You showed it by unit mass, but if, if it's by volume or by structural needs for the building or the other application, that should be different. Yeah, well, that's true. But, and I don't know how those numbers actually, actually meter out. But I was talking, my numbers I'm talking about is just an energy intensity factor. But it turns out it's going to become more and more complicated to assess that because you've got to look at CO2 release or other greenhouse gases as well as the energy and like you said you know how you actually utilize the material there's all kinds of funny equations that people are devising like people are talking about trying to put lots of slag which is a steel making waste product into concrete and the steel manufacturers that produce the slag are trying to think of ways of passing on the cost to those people uh, for the co2 and the energy while you know, everybody thinks who's going to get these waste products that they're going to get it for free because these companies are happy to sell it, give it to you. They're not happy to give it to you if they think it has value. And that, so there's, it's going to be a pretty complicated thing. The other thing that's interesting in Europe that isn't happening here is that they're trying to set up standards uh, for life cycle analysis so you can really see all the different things that Professor Garfunkel is referring to. And it's really a complicated thing. I mean, there are people now who are working on trying to develop what those metrics are and how to do it. Um, and that's a talk in itself. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much.